Welcome again, everybody, and thank you for assembling for our plenary session of today's IFAM Population Health Forum. I'm Ron Ackerman. I direct the Institute for Public Health and Medicine and serve as the uh, Senior Associate Dean for uh, Public Health at Feinberg School of Medicine. Uh, I have the distinct privilege of uh, announcing a couple of awards for research uh, excellence in research, uh, which were uh, coming out of our, our poster presentations out in the foyer and um, also uh, announcing and inviting up our keynote uh, speaker today. Um, so uh, first, I would be remiss if I didn't really uh, send out a special thanks to uh, the planning committee. Um, they did all of the work, everything that you see here today, organizing all of the activities uh, was uh, basically the uh, the responsibility and, and uh, the, really a, a tremendous amount of work by uh, Kara Peterson, uh, Catherine Swari, uh, Adela Mizrahi, Mizrahi, uh, Mizrahi, Mizrahi uh, Ali Ebrecht, and, and, and Kevin Connolly. And I want to thank uh, the five of you, and uh, please join me in thanking them for organizing the day. <laughs> And I want to also thank the poster judges. It's a lot of work to, to walk around and, and uh, you know, view all of the, you saw how many posters were out there. It really is exciting. And um, these uh, folks volunteered today to, to be poster judges. I want to thank uh, uh, Nori, Sarah, Neil, uh, Marquita, uh, Andrew, Rachel, and Lori for their help uh, with uh, uh, really um, coming up with uh, uh, judging of the posters. So thank you to them as well. A round of applause. So we have two awards to give today. Um, one is uh, honoring Dr. Bing Chang. Uh, Bing, uh, if you don't know, is uh, really the, uh, uh, I think the the father of uh, public health education here at Feinberg School of Medicine. He led uh, a committee in the Department of Preventive Medicine back in the 1990s to reimagine public health training at Feinberg. And that committee, uh, you know, really was responsible for uh, coming up with a plan to really uh, focus on, on uh, graduate uh, public health training excellence here and that we would continue and not just, uh, you, you know, uh, offer casual MPH degrees, but have a real uh, accredited program. And he led that program uh, for 13, 14 years. I, maybe it was longer than that because he was in the role of uh, 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 director of the program of public health um, until probably 2015 or 16. So um, he also was the uh, founding inaugural director of the Institute. Um, and uh, my predecessor in my current role here as uh, Senior Associate Dean for Public Health at Feinberg School of Medicine. Um, he's also, a, a, you know, still a very active uh, researcher and, uh, and sees patients. So he's, uh, we, we thank him for his uh, time and dedication to public health. And we have an uh, award for research excellence uh, given to um, uh, the sort of top judge poster in the session this morning from our judge committee. Uh, and uh, I want to invite Bing up in a moment as I announce the winner. Uh, and uh, I'm here to, to say that the winner is, drum roll, uh, it is, thank you, Dr. Lindsay Allen and the impact of staggered benefit disbursement on illicit opioid use. So I'll invite Dr. Allen to come up and Bing. We also uh, honor excellence in research by a community partner and uh, want to give out that award as well, uh, also based on uh, judging in the poster session this morning. Um, that award is, drum roll again, please, thank you, to 
Dr. Diana Ingram on behalf of Pastors for PCOR for the project Community Emotional Stability through a Faith-Based Community Academic Partnership. Dr. Ingram. And one more round of applause for all of the poster presenters today. It was a great session. Thank you so much. So I don't have my notes on the... Thank you. <laughs> Need my introduction notes. Uh, I now have the distinct uh, honor of, uh, of uh, introducing our keynote presenter today, who's uh, Dr. John Rich. Uh, John is the inaugural director, inaugural director of the Rush BMO Institute for Health Equity, whose mission is to build, evaluate, and sustain scalable approaches to improve health and eliminate health inequities with a focus on communities in West Chicago. The Institute works by leveraging Rush's excellence in research, education, community clinical practice, policy, and advocacy, as well as community partnerships. Prior to joining Rush, Rich served as professor of health management and policy at the Dornsife School of Public Health at Drexel University. In addition, he was director and co-founder of the Drexel Center for Nonviolence and Social Justice where he developed interventions for survivors of violence and trauma, as well as new approaches for training and deploying community health workers uh, and uh, peer interventions. Um, Dr. Rich's work focuses on issues of urban violence, trauma, and health inequities, particularly as they affect the health of men of color. His book, Wrong Place, Wrong Time, Trauma and Violence in the Lives of Young Black Men tells the stories of young survivors. With that, I would like to call up Dr. John Rich, and we also have a nice award for him. So please join me in recognizing Dr. Rich. Thank you, my friend. I'll never forget the day in the early 90s when I was walking through Boston City Hospital and I ran into my colleague, Dr. Jonathan Woodson. Now, Jonathan and I knew each other because we trained together at Mass General Hospital. He was in surgery and I was in internal medicine. And independently, we had found our way to Boston City Hospital. The hospital in Boston that was serving largely people of color in the surrounding neighborhoods of Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan. And that day, Jonathan was distraught and frustrated. He said, you know, a couple of months ago, a young guy came in with a gunshot wound to the chest. And we were able to get him to the operating room to repair it. Had it been two inches to the right, he would have been dead. And we were able to get him back on his feet. And then, this morning, he said, I'm riding it in my car, and I hear on the radio that he's been killed. So he said, 
we have to do something. You know, we have these young people, they're in the hospital, they, they lie in bed for days, nobody talks to them, what, what can we do? And I felt some of the same, because at Boston City Hospital, if you walked around, you'd see lots of young people in various different clinics, orthopedic clinic, dermatology, surgical clinic, sexually transmitted disease clinic, but I rarely saw them in primary care. And, and that was the reason a few months earlier I had actually started a clinic called the Young Men's Health Clinic to try and find a way to bring these young people in. But many times, even there, I would, when I would invite a young person to take off his shirt so I could listen to his lungs, I'd see scars from past injuries. And these were just the physical scars of physical injury. And so I began to think about how I could learn more about the experiences of these young men, why it was that they would cycle through in terms of violence. And I thought about the fact that when I interacted with my colleagues or uh, people that I knew in the community, they often would blame the young people themselves for the injuries that they had. And to be honest, it really went like this. These young men don't just get shot, they get themselves shot. And it was troubling to me until I realized that in the back of my mind, I kind of held the same idea. That I had this little virus, perhaps, in my brain that attributed, for these young people particularly, their victimization somehow to their participation. And yet my experience in talking with young people in clinic didn't bear that out. Many of these young people had been victims of robbery. They had been injured in communities where there were far too many guns and were struck while sitting on their porch. In many ways, these young people were no different from me in the neighborhoods that I lived in. And so I began to realize that for me, though I'm, an, I'm a black man, and many of these were young black men, that I had identities that were privileged, that would somehow, in my mind, counterbalance um, the challenges of racism. But for many of these young people, they had none of those. And so I began to do qualitative research to interview young people to understand what it was about behavior, what it was about the ways of thinking that would lead them to be injured. And ultimately I came to understand that it was really about their trauma. It was really about their experiences in the world that fed them into a cycle of violence that began with trauma. As a colleague of mine says, if violence is contagious, then trauma is the virus. And so even as I talked with these young people, I, for example, would ask them questions about their experiences. And in the Young Men's Health Clinic, 80% of these young people were uninsured. 20% said they had never seen a doctor. Now that's unlikely if they were born in a hospital, for example, but what they're really saying is in their, in their memory, they had never seen a doctor. 25% said they had never seen a dentist. About half said they had suffered a violent injury in the past. More than half said they had witnessed the shooting or stabbing. A quarter said they didn't feel safe. And about half said at some point in their lives they had been harassed by the police. Now, that last statistic, of course, is no surprise to us now, given uh, the way in which this kind of brutality has been captured on video. But for many of these young people at the time, that many people doubted the credibility even of that statement in their lives. And so, for me, this has become about trying to understand not only how trauma impacts the lives of these young people, but how the biases about these young people get under our skin, and how part of a large part of the process of healing is in our court. 
And so I'll tell you something you, you already know, but we often talk about post-traumatic stress disorder as, as a problem for people who have experienced extreme life-threatening trauma. And just to walk you through, the, the four categories into which the symptoms fall are hyperarousal or hyperactivity. That's the jumpiness, the feeling unsafe, difficulty sleeping that is common among people who have suffered trauma. Uh, Re-experiencing and intrusive symptoms. That's what we often talk about as nightmares or flashbacks, which are waking dreams, or body memories. So you feel a pain in your body as you pass the place that triggers your memory. Emotional numbing, and we don't often talk about this symptom, but it's the the disconnect between what a person's talking about is kind of dissociative and what they're talking about and their perceived emotion. And many of the young people that I met tell, would tell me that they, in the aftermath of their injury, had lost the ability to feel fear and had lost the ability to feel love as a consequence of the trauma. And finally, neg- negative alteration in cognition or mood difficulty concentrating or depression. Now, I, I give that to you just as a preface to a digital story that I'd like to share with you. As a part of our work in Philadelphia and engaging survivors, we invite them to participate in a digital story workshop where they put together a video telling their story with the words and images that they want to use. It's a healing strategy where they're able to put themselves into the story, and in many ways reconstruct for themselves a a narrative that's more healing. And I'd like to share this brief video with you, but first I simply want to acknowledge that many of us in our lives living in cities have experienced trauma. It may be direct, it may be vicarious. But we always think about what is a trauma-informed approach. And so I would just let you know that while there are no graphic images in this three-minute video, he's talking about his experience. And if you think or feel like that would be cause you distress, please take care of yourself. Do what you need to do if it's slip out or close your eyes or breathe. Uh, I want to be particularly aware of the fact that studies show that many of us have experienced in our childhood significant trauma, and that makes trauma a much more ubiquitous experience than we often acknowledge. I'm also gonna ask you for your help, because as you listen to this digital story, I want you to listen for any words or phrases that just stick in your mind. Not an analysis, not a paraphrase, but really anything that sticks out, because we're going to do a process called recall. I'm just going to ask you to say out loud anything in this person's words that stays with you. Okay? So this is uh, a digital story by David Green. None of the people I knew in the sandbox is alive today. I was shooting basketball with friends at the playground the first time I saw someone get shot. It was random. I didn't think something like that would happen to me or my family. I have seen a lot. Now I don't sleep at nights. Last year my cousin was killed at home in his bed. While everyone is sleeping, I stay awake. I go to sleep in the morning when people are up and moving around. When I do sleep, I have nightmares. Sometimes I wake up crying, feeling lonely, wanting revenge. I wake up paranoid. But there was something that really hurt me even more than when I got shot three times. I was sitting in the street with my brother's head in my lap. Dude stood over him holding a gun before running away. Dude just left. There was nothing I could do. My brother wanted me to hold him. I was crying, panicking. He said, I'm going to be all right. 
Little did he know, he wasn't. After that, I knew I would get shot. I started imagining how it would be and how I would hold my body so that they wouldn't shoot me in my heart or my head. When walking in the streets, I would think about how to turn my body so that the bullet would hit my shoulders and not my heart. Or how I would use my hands and arms to shield my head. I'm always looking back over my shoulder at my own shadow, hoping that one day I will stop focusing on my past but looking ahead to my future. So anyone, what words, phrases struck you? I'm always looking at my back. Thank you. <coughs> anyone else? Revenge. Revenge. All in the back. Preparing for the shot. Preparing for the shot. Thank you. I don't sleep at night. I don't sleep at night. Thank you. Lonely. Lonely. Thanks. Thank you. Physical and emotional. Panicking. Panicking. Expectation. Expecting to get shot. That's right. Anything else? It was random. It was random. Right. Thank you. Someone else in the back. No one in the sandbox is alive today. Thank you. Protecting his heart and his head. Uh, holding his head in my lap. I know, I'm sorry if I'm missing folks. Thank you, though. Others? Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. It's powerful to, to engage in the, the chosen words of the young people, given that they're experiences can be transformed. Let me just walk you through some of the things that you said. So someone pointed out, none of the people I knew in the sandbox is alive today. This is often the experience of young people who, who over their lives have experienced unspeakable losses, very much different from many of us. My cousin was shot in his bed, and consequently, I don't sleep at night. He talks about nightmares, waking up crying, feeling lonely, wanting revenge. He said, my brother wanted me to hold him. He was crying, panicking. And he said, after that, I knew I'd get shot. So if we map these against what we know about trauma, he's experienced multiple traumas growing up and early in his life. Hyper aroused, he doesn't sleep at night, doesn't feel safe. Feeling depressed and sad re-experiencing more trauma in his life. And then this hyper-arousal or, or reenactment uh, of, of, act, of a kind of actions that wouldn't be effective in preventing him from getting shot, which is often folks get caught in a cycle of actions that may not help them but are driven by the trauma. And so... We have to understand the context in which trauma happens and, and the consequences for us as a society and as healthcare professionals. So what we know is studies have shown that if you follow people who have had a penetrating injury for five years, 44% of them will have been, had a penetra- another penetrating injury or will have been shot or stabbed again. And the mortality at five years for that group is 20%. And so, um, and it's not all violence related. In 70% of those cases, substance abuse is listed as a contributing cause of death. 
And so you begin to see the makings of a cycle. Um, and for us in healthcare, we'd have to ask ourselves, is that an acceptable five-year recurrence rate of a disease that we see? Um, if it were uh, cardiovascular, if we're thinking about a cardiovascular condition, a, 20, a five-year mortality of 20% in young people. Uh, but often the idea is this isn't really our job, right? It doesn't really fall to us. It's more complicated and therefore uh, we may not play a role. But let me suggest the cycle of violence that came out of the research that we were doing uh, in Boston that may suggest for us a role. So what we have is a young person who is shot, stabbed, or assaulted is in the hospital. And they, um, let's assume this young person has post-traumatic stress disorder. What often happens in their experience is that no one talks to them about that. So this young person may not know anything about why these symptoms are with him as he makes his way into the community. Well, if you have these kinds of intrusive symptoms, you would most likely, lacking a primary care provider or access to health care, turn to whatever is in your environment that would help you with that pain. And cannabis is a logical substance to turn to, right? And we, I talked to young people who said, you know, I used to smoke, but then I, after I got injured, I changed it so I'd smoke before night, before I went to bed at night because it would help keep the nightmares away. So very tactical, strategic in, in terms of keeping away the, the intrusive symptoms. Well, what happens though if you're smoking cannabis? Entry level jobs will be off the table for you. If you're on probation and you show up with a dirty urine, you're, you're gonna be remanded. So your self-treatment for a disease you're not quite sure where it came from may in fact have really negative consequences for you. On the other hand, uh, let's say you feel really unsafe. We know that young people in urban environments, both men and women, do not trust the police to protect them. And if you're hyper aroused and you really believe you're in danger, then a firearm may be a logical, I'm not suggesting acceptable or wise, but a logical choice. And if you have a firearm, we know that puts you at risk, obviously, for incarceration or death. But there is a, there's an arc here that is not simply about the traditional idea that bad people doing bad things get shot, they go back out, they do more bad things, they get shot again. It really is about the pain and the intense trauma in the social context. And so part of my work has been to tell this story not only as a way to, to, to share the voices of these young people, but also to share my own journey and position, which is to candidly say, we often carry biases against these young people that put us in a, a position of judgment rather than as positions of healers. But there is a lot we can do. And so in addition to the work of the Young Men's Health Clinic, one of the things that I, my partner Ted Corbin, were able to do um, in Philadelphia was to launch a hospital-based violence intervention program that was focused on trauma. So when a young person came into the hospital, men or women, we would focus on the trauma primarily, orient people to what might happen to them in the coming days, make sure they're safe, and then invite them to be a part of a six to eight month healing journey where peers and social workers would work with them to help them reconnect, to keep them from falling off the path to healing in those days. With that, we realized that the very best healers are young people who've had the lived experience and who are in their healing journey as well. And so with support from the Department of Justice, we launched a community health worker peer training academy to make sure that these young people who had come through their healing could have an opportunity to give back and to advance into healthcare fields as a pipeline and so we have a number of training classes. We've trained over 70 young people to enter this profession and to work alongside those of us who are doing this work. And so part of our healing is to equip those who are most talented in this area 
to be the healers with us. So again, what does this mean for us? This issue is really about us in medicine and public health, and what can we bring to the discourse about violence, trauma, structural racism in our own work? And that's why I'm I'm really grateful for this opportunity to be with you today and to hear your thoughts, to see your great work, to understand the history of the Institute, and to engage in this conversation. Because all of us, more than ever, are talking about the social determinants of health. We're talking about the context of race as it applies across the board. And so we we recognize that a health equity framework, here in the list we see all of the things we talk about as the social determinants of health, And we know that racism and other isms impact those social determinants of health. So that even if we are attending to issues of education, knowing that education is very much related to overall health, we know that racism decreases the value of education for black and brown people. And so we have to incorporate an understanding of the ways in which the social determinants of health themselves are impacted by structural racism. I will borrow from Dr. Kamara Jones in her definition of racism as a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on the phenotype race that unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities, unfairly advantages other individuals and communities, and saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. I think it's a powerful definition. She's laid out institutional racism, personally mediated racism, and internalized racism as the components, the different ways in which racism plays out. More recently, we talk, and this is definition from Zinzi Bailey, as published in The Lancet, about structural racism right alongside or incorporating institutional racism, which in her words refers to the totality of ways in which societies foster racial discrimination through mutually reinforcing systems of housing, education, employment, earnings, benefits, credit, media, health care, and criminal justice. These patterns, in turn, reinforce discriminatory beliefs, values, and distribution of resources. So it pairs right alongside of Dr. Kamara Jones' definition to think about all of these structures and how they're complicit and how they intersect in creating these, um, these barriers. And of course now, think about where we are. The ongoing trauma of the COVID pandemic, the economic distress, the police racism and uprisings did not affect all of us equally. These were concentrated, the effects, the negative effects were concentrated in poor communities and in communities of color. And so how do we think about that in terms of structural racism? Well, I would suggest the term, and others, of course, before me, the term racial trauma. That there is a particular type of trauma, and this is the definition of the American Psychological Association, that we have to be attentive to, realizing that the way that uh, the structures exist in our society, trauma may very much be disproportionately, um, may disproportionately impact black and brown people. And so the definition of the American Psychological Association is the one you see before you and incorporates the accumulation of many small occurrences such as everyday discrimination and microaggressions. I also gravitate to a definition from a colleague, Dr. Ken Hardy, a brilliant psychologist who has really opened up our eyes about racial trauma. 
He says racial oppression is a traumatic form of interpersonal violence which can lacerate the spirit, scar the soul, and puncture the psyche. By his definition, there are four components of racial trauma. Internalized evaluation. That is what the world constantly tells you about your worth, or your, rather your unworthiness. And it often makes young people hypervigilant about respect. And so if the world is constantly telling you that you're worthless, then you often have to defend your value when, it is, um, when there's an affront to it. An assaulted sense of self. He, this identifies the accumulated messages of devaluation that make it hard to know who you really are. And if you think about critical periods of development, adolescence, when, you're, when you experience this assaulted sense of self, it can be very difficult to figure out who you are and who you will look to as a model. Internalized voicelessness. And a lot of you know this one, right? It's the, it, it erodes your ability to defend against the barrage of unwelcome negative and debilitating messages. So if you, if you say something, you're a troublemaker, right? You're angry. You're uh, never satisfied, right? Does anybody resonate with that experience of internalized voicelessness, right? And so you don't say anything, right? Because it seems like it would be it, it, it's, there's, more, there's risk, right, if you say something. Although, one of the things that Ken says is, there's risk either way, right? Either you push it down or it comes out, but there's risk either way. And then, this is really important, rage. Rage can be mistaken for anger, but rage is not anger. Rage is a deep-seated emotional response to degradation and devaluation. And so when we, it's a longer term, deeper. It can't be treated with anger management. It has to be dealt with other ways. And, and here are the ways, some of the healing ways. Well, we can counteract internalized evaluation through affirmation and acknowledgement, conveying a general understanding and acceptance of the premise that race is a critical organizing principle in our society. Creating space for race, that is encouraging candid and open conversations. You know, easier said than done, many would say. But intentionally, we can create the space for those conversations. The count, to counter internalized voicelessness is to create space for racial storytelling. That is to encourage narratives about early experiences and how all of us were socialized as young people. And then rechanneling rage. How do we identify opportunities for this deep-seated outrage against the, the way that one's been treated to, um, to be channeled into more developmental activities? So in Ken's words, it's the process is to name it, claim it, and tame it. And it can be a powerful source of, of motivation once it's identified. Now, I, I lingered here in part because we are now increasingly trying to understand how this is playing out in our day-to-day -day and how it plays out in intergenerational trauma. So I'd like to share with you, some of you know what this is, but a life-changing experience that I had just back in September. I had the opportunity to, develop, to visit the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama. This is the sometimes called the lynching memorial that Brian Stevenson constructed. Brian Stevenson being the, the um, leader of the Equal Justice Initiative, which works around ending uh, mass incarceration. And it's, it's, it's a powerful, it's almost spiritual place to go. Brian says his interest is not in punishment but in liberation. He says, I believe that truth-telling can set us free. We can no longer be silent about our history. If we find the courage to engage in truth-telling, something good will happen, more like freedom, 
or equality or justice. But to get there, we have to do the hard work. And so when you enter this space, what you'll see are these these long columns, you see them here, with the names of people who were victims of racial terrorism um, in the South, but not only in the South, across the country, in the period of the Reconstruction forward. And it's really, um, there are certainly counties in, in our state of Illinois where substantial numbers of people were lynched or otherwise brutalized. And this really is a process of, of excavating, both figuratively and literally, those experiences. And so there are people who go to various counties and gather dirt from places where people were lynched and bring that, that soil back as, um, as an acknowledgement of the person's life. It's a, it's, a, it's a place that you go, at least for me, where the things I know become viscerally experienced. The knowledge becomes visceral. You feel it in your body. So who's been there? I'm just curious who's been. Thank you. It's, it's a destination because you don't, you don't happen through Montgomery. At least I don't happen through Montgomery often. I'm just That's not a judgment. Um, but it, it's, it's a powerful place to be. And, and so the Legacy Museum, again, reminds us of the history that's lost. Now, occasionally someone says to me, look, John, you know, slavery was a long time ago. Right? That's like 170 years ago. Slavery ended. Like, why are... Yeah, I'm sure there's some effects. Well, one thing that happens when you go there, and I, and I um, with apologies to any historians in the room, I would just say it reminded me that there's a history we don't often get taught about Reconstruction. And that is the fact that in the years, the 12 years following the end of slavery, people who had emerged, former slaves emerged into society, eager to be a part of the society, protected by the Freedmen's Bureau and federal troops in the South. And so people started businesses, they started farms, they, they ran for office. In some towns, the voting population went from you know, all white to 80% black. And so people got elected to office. And in that time, three amendments to the Constitution were ratified. The 13th Amendment, which ended chattel slavery. The 14th Amendment, which established birthright citizenship and equal protection under the law. And then the 15th Amendment, which gave everyone, every man, the vote. So black men were empowered to vote. Of course, not women at that time. And there was all kinds of legislation that came through Congress, civil rights, in the hands of the then Republican Party. And, but after about 12 years, recession, political um, compromise led to the end of Reconstruction and the withdrawal of those troops from the South. And then a reign of racial terror was unleashed on those people who remained. So many of them came north not seeking new opportunity, or not only seeking new opportunity, many of them leaving behind their possessions and fleeing for their lives as refugees. And all of the advances were rolled back, rolled back. The Supreme Court then finally in 1896 ruled in Plessy versus Ferguson that separate but equal would be the law of the land. And Jim Crow segregation began at that time and extended into at least when the Civil Rights Acts were passed in 64 and 65. Now just think about what happened just before that. In 54, the Supreme Court overturned Plessy in Brown versus the Board of Education, so desegregated the school system, but only not practically because there was a lot of work that had to be done. Um, and in 1958 is the year that Emmett Till was murdered. So now take us into, so we're now in the mid 60s and we've only now emerged. So all of the experiences, and you'll notice that if you can't see it, the Legacy Museum says from enslavement to mass incarceration. And so there's a through line that comes from that Jim Crow history into mass incarceration. 
and affects the lives of the young people that we see today. So we're not that far from that experience. And so part of our work, we believe, is to change the toxic narrative that was necessary to justify the subjugation of black people when slavery could no longer do it, right? So it was about black people as as savage, black people as rapists, black people as lazy, a strategy that was intentional to create an impression. Now that gets under everybody's skin, and that's what we have to find and root out. So part of our work has been about narrative change, not only about that arc of history, but also about the power that black people and communities of color across the nation have mobilized toward our own healing. There's a lot of healing that goes on in the community. It may not be clinical professionals delivering it, but there are a lot of healing, ways of healing that are very much um, accessible, and we have to make that a part of what we do. And so we launched with the help of an extraordinary marketing communications firm called The Mighty Engine, a social media campaign called Our Words Heal. And I'd like to share with you the launch video so you can get a sense of what the power of engaging with the real experts and community around these issues can be while also acknowledging the, the wounds and the scars of trauma. I can still see that vision so clearly in my head. The picture is so vivid. Everything, like, it's, it's just play over and over and over. How do I hope from that? I mean, everybody's trauma is different. I've had my really, really low moments where it just felt like, you know, what am I here for? When you constantly think about that or you bring it up in conversations, that's you not being able to get past it. Um, and that's what trauma does. It, it leaves you in that moment. It leaves you in that space. If you're in a neighborhood, you know, where every day is a shooting, you can feel like it's a space where you can't escape. You can't address the sliver of the individual um, trauma that people uh, face without looking at the large picture of like how this was designed. Because that one individual, you can multiply that by thousands and thousands and thousands. On TV, you see mainly other races on the couch talking to a psychiatrist or um, a counselor. You don't really see us, so it's like, I don't think this is something I'm supposed to do. I've never seen my mom or my dad do it, so am I supposed to do this too? But it's like a greater sense that it's like, no, just go and get help. You start to learn you and how you respond. And if you can't get back to joy in a, a decent amount of time, then you need help. And also I think it's really important to be able to share your story because there are a lot of people in the world who like go through so many things, but they're just like, no one looks like me, no one understands, no one gets me, but it's like, there are people who understand, there are people who get you and who are going through the same things. Like I'm not with Kyle every day, but I, it's something in my heart, like me being connected to him and like reaching out, like that just heals me. I let them tell their story. Like, um, I validate it family, whether it's a grandparent, whether it's the woman down the street, whether it's the uncle at the, uh, the rec center, there's a community piece that steps in and says, like, you know what, I'm going to watch out for you, I'm going to look out for you. I feel education about trauma is so important. Being educated about trauma will help I spent a large part of my life living in a hyper masculine phase that I thought was okay. So I did the fight in the middle school, been thrown out of school rules and stuff like that. So that's when I kind of found sports and that's when I started to try to move away from that behavior and be an individual. You know, be working out and um, I also like to draw. I joined the boxing team, learned how to start boxing. Music has always been my sort of go-to. Running takes away like, it takes me out of the world. Okay, so I do a lot of fictional writing. I meditate. You don't hear about that often and not from no black male. I inhaled it and then I breathed it out. For me, drumming was definitely like my escape. You don't have to be subjected to what you see outside. You know, speaking as like negativity that, you know, you can always be positive. My smile should make you smile. <laughs> So this was a new um, 
a new adventure for us because this is not a commercial. This is, these are people sharing their experiences and their stories. But it does make me think a lot about how we change the narrative, how we, how we participate in a narrative that is about hope and healing as well as about the challenges that we face. Um, because if we perpetuate this negative uh, narrative, I think it gets, it continues to get in us and under our skin. So where are we now? As you know, as a result of longstanding structural inequities and the COVID pandemic, there are devastating life expectancy differences between neighborhoods that are barely five miles away from each other. So as you see, there's a 16 year life expectancy gap between uh, Oak Park and East Garfield Park. And so one of the aspirations of the work that's been happening at Rush, particularly in partnership with Westside United, has been to say, can we reduce that life expectancy gap by 50% by 2030? Now that's kind of a moonshot, particularly given that, that the structural factors became so much more uh, powerful during the COVID pandemic. But we know that more than half of these premature deaths on the West side are caused by chronic disease. Uh, violence is a part of the whole, but it isn't all about violence. It is about other factors that are related to the trauma and the economic deprivation that exists. And so, as Ron shared, the Institute is really how do we bring together the assets and the history of engagement at Rush in partnership with community? Because one powerful thing about Rush is that the leaders set health equity as a strategic priority in 2016 and established a partnership with the community, building an organization in the community uh, in 2018. So this preceded many of the devastating activities, the racial violence that happened in 2020. And so there is a foundation to move forward on. Some of our aspirations include building and sustaining authentic community partnerships and community engaged research in partners by building community based research networks. There's a network called the Alive Faith Network, which is a network of churches and pastors informing the kind of research that they want to see in the community. Um, supporting interdisciplinary, interprofessional educational programs so that we graduate, so that every student who graduates from Rush will be able to reflect on issues of racial socialization and think about how that impacts not only the individual practice, but the public health practice. Uh, producing the next generation of scholars and practitioners and educators in health equity and supporting equitable clinical practice, thinking about how do we redesign care models in order to reduce the rates of chronic conditions that are disparate uh, between populations. And certainly a goal is to develop community partnerships and expand those partnerships to address intergenerational trauma working together with culturally responsive approaches to healing and thriving that improve community well-being. And we recognize that within our health system, we're made up of people from the community. So the community doesn't start and stop at the doors, of the, um, at the doors into the health system. We're all a part of it. And so they're powerful efforts, again, obviously preceding me, uh, as I've been here for just five months. But in 2018, health systems, a number of health systems that you see came together to stand up Westside United as an organization that will launch to full self-sufficiency in 2014 that really becomes the community-based holder of the mission to improve health, to reduce disparities, to improve economic well-being in the community. And so as we move forward, the things that I think about and I think you think about as well are that we have an opportunity to advance health equity, but we have to be aware of some of the forces. So I, 
It's going to be important, I think, as we move into this phase to resist the notion of competition in silos. So as health equity centers, institutes spring up, are we, are we going to be like, oh, I've got the best health equity center over there. That one's terrible. You know, how do we take this and realize that it will require all of us to have a focus? It may be different depending on the geographic area. But competition in this space is not productive. How do we think about medicine and public health rather than medicine versus public health? And those of us who find ourselves in rooms uh, where we have both folks who are in healthcare and folks who are in public health sometimes see this dynamic play out. But the COVID pandemic taught us, like we should have learned before, that you can't think about it as either or, that these, are, these need to be integrated, that there needs to be an ongoing relationship so that we're prepared not only for the new things that come along, but to address the things that have been structural for so long. The power of partnership, which you already know. And then finally, speaking truth. It can be hard to speak truth in a fractious political environment or to figure out what the truth is. But I would say, I would simply share with you this quote, which meant, has meant a lot to me. I'm for truth no matter who tells it. I'm for justice no matter who it is for or against. I'm a human being first and foremost. And as such, I'm for whoever and whatever benefits humanity as a whole. That's uh, El Haj Malik El Shabazz, otherwise often referred to as Malcolm X. And then this quote from Maya Angelou, which is on the side of the original legacy museum in Montgomery, which is that history, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. And so for us together, this is about our ability now to face history and the truth and about structural racism, even in the face of this political environment, and to, I, I look out on, on all of the students, learners, colleagues who are here to realize that this is us. This is us for now. I applaud all of you for committing to the hard work of health equity and, and speaking the truth. And I'm excited for the opportunity to work closely with you across institutions, across communities. So thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. stories. Dr. Stroger Hospital, <clears throat> born and raised in Newark, New Jersey, then moved near Philly. Dad moved me out of Newark because he didn't think I would survive. I'm 82, so I've survived. <clears throat> so I see on a daily basis these victims who are heroes, shot, stabbed, raped, beaten. Inmates, we call them uh, another name that's more complimentary, detainees. What, a, what an improvement, huh? And I see them paralyzed in heart and mind and soul. And it, there's not a lot of hope out there that it will change anytime soon. There's hope and a smile. I'm an acupuncturist, and I see some remarkable, I call it neuroplastic healing. 
a change, a shift in the consciousness that then shows up in the body. And sometimes I ask my patients, how good can you stand it? Because before then, it all looks bad. So I'm a partner. I guess that's what I want to say in this mission. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. That's powerful. John, in a, in a practical sense, for those in the audience who might be interested in engaging with you and your work here as it begins uh, in Chicago with your new institute and Westside United, what, what's the best approach to use? Um, we're not, I, I think your, your message of collaboration is, is really well received, and I think there's a lot of folks in the audience who would love to be part of what you're doing. Um, what's the best way to do that? Well, but let me say that um, as the Institute grows and develops and sets out a strategic vision, there are ongoing efforts that are happening in Chicago nearby. For example, their Healing Hurt People, which is that hospital-based violence intervention that I told you about, which was launched in Philadelphia, has been replicated at Stroger Hospital. And that, you know, it's, it's really a humbling experience to develop a program and then have it replicated and have that replication be like so much more awesome than what you started in the sense that it's larger, they, they meet the needs of large communities. So supporting those activities that are already happening um, and to really reaching out to those places to understand what their needs are and how we could meet them. Many times, um, the power is in relationship. And so I would simply say that our, for me again, as a new uh, person to Chicago and new to Rush, I would just like opportunities for us to think about how do we establish relationships, opportunities to come together, to talk about our respective work, to talk about new approaches to understanding complexity and how factors intersect, new intersectional approaches to research. I think there's a lot we could do. And I'd welcome the opportunity to sit with you. And, he, and I know that there's incredible work. I can see the incredible work here to think about how we model a less um, competitive. I'm not suggesting the environment's now competitive, but it's just inevitable that we find ourselves um, sort of comparing ourselves to others. Um, and I think hopefully in the future, in the not too distant future, I can be more specific about the specific ideas that we're pursuing in the Institute and how we might, um, learners might engage with that. I think there's a... That's, that's a really important question. The, the question was, how do those of us who are doing this on a daily basis uh, sustain ourselves? And, and I think that is a critical opportunity for uh, health systems and public health systems to turn our attention to. Obviously, that became a large concern during the COVID pandemic, so compassion fatigue. Um, but I think that with regard to um, the work that's happening in communities, it's often those frontline workers, many of whom have had the lived experience of trauma, who are now devoting themselves to this work 
who are most negatively impacted by the work itself because they're also struggling with economic issues. So, for example, I'm on the board of the Institute for Nonviolence that's doing work on the ground in communities. And, and we as a board have come to realize how important it is to build the support in for frontline workers to sustain them that we can't deplete them. So one of the potential uh, roles for health um, and public health institutions, behavioral health institutions, is to support community-based efforts by providing whatever healing, acupuncture, healing for pain, for many of these young people are carrying their own physical wounds. But those are the kinds of partnerships I think where we see a connection between the work we do and the work that young people are doing, trying to decrease violence in their own neighborhoods. Um, we could share our approaches to that. They may not look like the traditional therapeutic approaches, but they might look just like those therapeutic approaches. Um, so I, I resonate with you. I think it's a constant, a con we have to pay constant attention to that. In our work in Philadelphia, we've also decided that there may be certain jobs that have kind of a shelf life. That when someone jumps into a job where they're gonna be visiting people in their homes, they're gonna be doing case management in the community, that that might have a three-year shelf life. And so from the very beginning, after we hire them, we begin to think about how do we develop them for the next position? Because otherwise, Folks will stay. I mean, they're, they're dedicated to the work. Hopefully, we're paying them a living wage, but the damage begins to accrue. And so it's our responsibility to develop them into career paths. Again, healthcare institutions have the opportunity to contribute. So thanks. Thanks. It's an important question. All right, well, thank you so much. I have to say that was one of the most amazing talks I've heard, and it really, you feel it inside. Um, so sorry, I think everyone's kind of <laughs> in, in, in this state of personal reflection almost. Um, but I did want to say, you know, I, I love everything you say and what you do, and one of my, um, or our center's focus is on young people and how do we pull them out of this early and show them, you know, kind of empowerment. And so we, uh, we have this program that I know Ron mentioned earlier, Health Leaders, um, where we try to bring people in and bring them in this room and um, do individual self-empowerment and teach them how to make health changes in their communities. And um, I remember, I mean, these students are incredible. They're bright, they're motivated, and they came in this room. And I remember that first day, you know, you belong here. And then they looked around at all the pictures and they're like, no, we don't. We don't belong here. Not one of them looks like me. And since then, they have changed them um, a little bit. But, I mean, why, why do we even need pictures of people on the wall? You know, like why, like little things that they point out to where you're like, this isn't their home. This isn't where I should be, you know? And so that was, um, that was really interesting to me. And then we said, okay, here's all these health topics we work on, diabetes, asthma, you know, like all these things, what do you want to work on? Every single one almost said mental health. There's a lot of issues in our community. And so we had split it up into all these health issues, but this year when we do it, they get to pick their own and they get to figure out some kind of an intervention. But my question to you is not to talk about this. It's how do we all combine the things that we're doing, because we don't know how to do this, but you're doing so many amazing things, and we would love to incorporate it into programming that we have, you know, like no reinvention of the wheel, um, but one, you know, like, is there a central place that we can, at least through the city of Chicago or nationally or internationally, pool resources and, and things that we have? Do you know of anything that exists like that? Can we create it together? build this collaboration even wider. And then my second question challenge to you is after being in something like this, what is one thing that we can all do, you know, to move this mission forward? This is a really, 
really good, challenging questions. I, um, in terms, I think we always try and think about how do we bring work to scale? When we're doing work in communities, so the work that we were doing in Philly, um, part of our goal was to see if we could expand it um, to, so that all of the hospitals in Philadelphia would have an opportunity. This started at Hahnemann Hospital. It's a long story, Hahnemann Hospital closed. But how do we, what can we do to expand it to make it available? And so we initially had funding from the Department of Behavioral Health, which was, I think, sort of really groundbreaking to have them funding this work. We worked with them over years to develop a way to pay for this work through behavioral health Medicaid. So one of the things I would say is that whatever we're doing, we have to think about how it gets sustained into the future. And it was a long conversation, and there's some very specific peculiarities to the behavioral health system in Philadelphia that allowed this to happen. But now this work can go on at all of the hospitals, and they can get reimbursement under Medicaid. Not only that, but we were successful in getting a new model created because the, the existing models of behavioral health care are sort of um, expect that a client's going to come to an office. They might be crisis intervention. They might be psych rehab. Rather than trying to fit this program into a, an existing model, we were able to propose a new model. So not to get too into the weeds, but for example, the, the uh, outreach workers are delivering services in the community. So we work to get a reimbursement formula where the time that they, it takes for them to drive from the office to the person's house is reimbursable as long as the person's there when they get there, right? So trying to shape something that's more consistent with the way that work actually happens will help benefit across the board. Uh, there are national organizations now, something called the Health Alliance for Violence Intervention, for which hospital-based violence intervention programs across the country come together and advocate, and that it has grown tremendously. So I think there are national uh, collectives. Increasingly, our work, and we, I heard this talked about earlier, is going to be investing in and standing up and supporting organizations in the community to do this work and address um, by providing resources, continuous long-term resources, so that it can be community-led. And we can, as institutions, support those in ways that are collaborative and make sense. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. I, I want to take Ruchi's second question in a different direction. So you, you've talked a lot about healing and justice and equity, and these are universal themes here. And it occurs to me that there is a large population in our country who may not resonate with these themes. How do we, how do we engage those people and, and help to get them to think about these challenges in a different way? I have often heard the conversation about whether we're trying to change hearts and minds and whether or whether we're just trying to get some things done, right? So that's been, I think, in the health, in the health equity, health disparities field, sort of, well, let's, we could try and change people's hearts and minds, but let's just monitor outcomes and sanction people whose outcomes don't, who are disparate, right? The challenge there is the damage has been done by the time you've circled back and seen that someone is delivering care that's inadequate. Um, so I would say um, one way to do it, I don't have the, the, the answer, but, but one way to do it is to identify shared values. You, you say, you mentioned justice and equity. Why are those not shared values, right? Can, can we articulate fairness in a way that tells a story? So one way is to, is to not be an historical about this, to try and explain or ask the question, how did we get here? It didn't just, this isn't just the way it was. How did we get here? Can we, can we educate one another? Uh, can we then 
I think we do have to be, we have to depend upon the researchers in communication to tell us how to tell, how people receive information. So I don't think we should be um, sort of, I'm just going to, I'm just going to speak the truth. Let me stop. The, The way you have to speak the truth, but we have to figure out how to do it in a way that is effective. Communications researchers can help us. So there's a report that both um, is helpful to me and also gives me heartburn that came, <laughs> that came from the Frameworks Institute. I don't know if you're familiar with their work, but they essentially say, they look at framing effects. And they wrote a report in 2009 where they said, we looked at issues of racial disparities and we did research to determine which frame works and which frames don't work. And it's, it's disheartening because they said, talking about this as structural doesn't work. Talking about white privilege doesn't work. Now they're speaking specifically from a communications frame, but they, I, they did identify strategies that do work. And so I think the challenge for us going forward is to say, how do we in, embrace the truth, but figure out how to communicate with different audiences and balance the, you know, there can be a notion, well, if I speak the truth in a different way from the way that I want to, now I've sold out to some other, right, some other political ideology. I think we have to partner with communications um, colleagues to understand that sometimes the way that we tell the story may have the opposite effect. Uh, again, I, I, have to, I feel like I have to balance that kind of input because there's sometimes you just have to speak the truth, but we can be as smart as we can. Thank you. Thank you. John, that was a really wonderful talk and it <laughs> left me in tears. I, I was so moved. Um, I guess one of my thoughts is how something that we've struggled with in our work is how easy it is to describe problems and get published and get recognized for talking about problems and how difficult it is to actually formulate solutions and move forward with trying to implement them. I, it seems like you have answers to really complicated problems. At least some of the ones that you presented look like they're actually working in these communities. How much did you struggle with, do we test this? Do we do a study? Do we, let, do we get a grant to figure out if this works? And how much did you just say, I just want to do this because I think it's going to work and it's the right thing? It's a, it's a, great, it's a great question. And I don't, I think we, we have to evaluate the work that we, we do, but we can, we can learn different ways of evaluating the work. So one of the challenges for me has been, or one of the challenges I took on, I think, was to say, if we're going to start a clinic for young people who have been excluded from primary care, um, and you're going to ask me to prove that primary care helps them, but we're not, we're not doing the same for all the rest of us, right? then that doesn't seem fair. Okay, so if we're really just trying to, now we, there may be a case for studying whether primary care does what we hope it will do, but we shouldn't reserve that for people as though our offering it to them is such a sacrifice so we have to prove it, otherwise it would go away. So I think when we're trying to adjust and address an injustice, we should evaluate it, but I don't feel like we should be held to a standard of somehow um, proving that it works for a population when we haven't proved that it works for us. But I, again, I think that we have decided that we have to use a mixture of methods. We have to use qualitative methods, the work that you're doing, understanding the lived experience so that we fully allow for um, or we prevent the structural racism from became, being a part of our, of our work. So one of the ways that, and the Ted Corbin really led this this work was to say, let's look at outcomes for hospital-based violence intervention that aren't only about do people die down the road or do they get re-injured. Let's look at the mental health consequences. Can our intervention ease those mental health consequences, which we know are on the path to 
these relatively rare outcomes. And there's evidence that, that improvements in sleep quality, improvements in um, depression follow for these young people. Now, we, we just simply have to, I think, also understand that um, these, these factors are intersectional. They intersect with factors that we have to also make sure that we're measuring, um, such as economic deprivation, racial segregation in communities. So I, I, I certainly endorse that we have to do this work, but we have to, as we keep the focus on equity, we won't, um, we won't be limited in our work uh, by some statistical evaluation, but that we'll use more complex methods to understand, really for the purposes of how to do it better and how to serve more people in a more effective way. Hello, and uh, thank you so much for your exceptional presentation. Um, I'm a nurse in a correctional setting, a transitional setting, and a lot of times when I do their health intakes, a lot of the gentlemen endorse histories of depression, anxiety, PTSD. And when I've asked them if they ever received some sort of treatment for it, many of them have never um, seeked help for it because there's such a stigma tied to it that I'm not crazy or they're just going to give me medications. And those that have received medications, when I ask them, why did you stop taking them? They say because they didn't like the side effects of them or there was no follow-up. They never went to go get the refill. Um, there was no good, uh, there was not a good relationship between them and their healthcare provider, and so on. And so when I asked them if there is other forms of treatment that they were exposed to or offered, such as meditation, yoga, mindfulness, things of that sort, they all say no, and they look at me like I'm crazy. So when I offer um, meditation or yoga, they're like, just like as the gentleman in your video said, you've never seen another like black person do that. Or, you know, they there's such a stigma that these sort of therapies are only for people that are not of color. You know, there are people higher in the socioeconomical chain. Um, so my question to you is, how do you? work to motivate and to show these gentlemen that these are options for them and that there are good options that are worth exploring? Well, thank you for that question. I'm sure there are folks also here who are behavioral, in behavioral health who, who thought about this. One of the approaches that we realized with regard to victims of violence was that we had to, if the mixture of services was case management and concrete services and behavioral health services, we needed to lead with the concrete services. We first had to ask, what things do you need in your life? How do we meet your transportation needs, your, your medical? You, know, you wouldn't imagine how many young people who've had devastating injuries, for example, have um, colostomies leave without supplies to be able to care for those. So you have to get some very specific, how are you gonna get back and forth to your surgical appointment? So lead with the concrete services. But have, always have some conversation ongoing in, in that particular relationship about behavioral health. We also have used groups. So um, psychoeducational groups built on a model called the self model. But it was one of the participants um, came to, the participants came together and named them ciphers, cipher groups. And often what we would see is that uh, caseworker or social worker would say, listen, I want you to come to this group. It's like, oh, I'm not going. I want you to come to this group. Okay, I'll go, but I won't talk. Okay, come to the group. And of course, when you're in a group of people who share some similar experience, it opens the opportunity to talk about trauma in a safe way. And we feel that that is a readiness toward whether it's individual therapy, if that's what the person needs, or openness to medications. But it really or organizes, helps to organize thinking about, well, how might you think about that from a trauma perspective? So you feel angry, but what else might that be? And, but to your point, I, I do think there are practitioners who have developed um, culturally responsive yoga, culturally responsive drumming or movement therapy, understanding that with particular 
communities, movement matters greatly. And so we did a project with the community health worker peers with funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to develop a culturally responsive healing practice. And it included all of these elements that we talked about, including actually some uh, a personal trainer, African-American personal trainer doing this work, and a ceramics. So we had a, a colleague who does ceramics. And it was spaced over the course of two weeks. And we did a pre and post well-being assessment. And the increases were dramatic. So what we, what we were thinking about is, well, what kind of measures can we use to capture the impact of this experience that aren't about these distal measures like does somebody get shot or stabbed again? Those are important. But, um, and we found it was dramatic. So we're now beginning to use assessments of well-being to assess, to see you know, what's happening in the, in the works. So I think there may be barriers in terms of um, reimbursement, coverage, and there may actually, we may not be engaging the healers and communities um, most effectively. And so I think those, um, I, I love that you're thinking about this. I think there are, that would be a great piece of work for us to, to undertake together. I, oh. Hi. Oh. I can go? All right. Hi, guys. Um, I know we have like two, well, one minute now. Um, thank you for your talk because this is um, completely amazing. I think I feel what you're feeling like. We were all in awe. We didn't know what to say. We we're all reflecting. And it's just every time you speak, I have like three more things that come up in my head. And the biggest thing that I've been thinking about recently, and this is going to be real controversial, but I'll just say it. I think that, you know, racism is a mental health issue and that people who practice racism and who've developed it had a, a mental health issue or something. I, I can't really articulate it, but we've been um, for, you know, past century trying to figure out how do we act better in a system that is super chaotic and is born in a mental health um, state that is just abnormal. And we're trying to rationalize it and we're working to do all this other stuff to say, well, you shouldn't feel so hurt. Um, <laughs> good luck, you know, do your own affirmations when the system is sick. And we don't acknowledge that enough. And I think that um, we need to somehow, and I think through storytelling, because what you said to me just was like amazing. Like if we can show how abnormal it is to be racist or to be elitist and not think about us as all human people who are trying to make it and that life is about joy and um, honoring each other and it's just appreciating each other. We, we build our systems on, as you say, um, competition and, and we just keep leading with all of those things. But that, that is not really normal or, or like it shouldn't be or, you know, as a child, you don't get up and like, look, I'm better than all the other little kids. <laughs> you just kind of like, you know, want to know each other and be around each other and to grow and develop. So I really appreciate this and I hope it'll be helpful for Chicago who's super segregated. I'm from Chicago. I grew up when I, when I went to school in St. Louis, it was the first time I knew about like, or even was really around other cultures. I was so a part of my culture. I didn't even know like racial slurs. I didn't know how, to, I'm like, I didn't grow up racist. Like I didn't know that you looked at people's noses a certain way or people's eyes. Like I, that didn't, I grew up in a black community and because of it, I didn't know how to be um, or see other people as negative. I'm an epidemiologist and being an epidemiologist, after some years, I realized, whoa, those are the people who told me that we black folks were less than everybody because of this, that, and they compared us to white people. And you know what I mean? And so as a director of epidemiology, I'm trying to change that through narrative and with my crew. Uh, so I just, I really want to thank you for being here. I really want to work with you. We at the Cook County Department of Public Health. Hi, everybody. Um, <laughs> but I just really feel inspired by this talk. And I just love that all of this is happening with all you guys. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That's powerful. Thank you.